Overhead, Air Force and Marine Corps planes support the ground troops. Carrier planes are ready for another strike on inland targets. Rockets are of particular interest at this time. Three different types are being used. One of the first super explosive types to see service in Korea was the five inch Holy Moses. Later, the 11.75 inch Tiny Tim proved highly effective on bridges and similar large targets. The most recent arrival is the Navy's 6.5 inch Ram. Constant activity on these carriers has not dampened the crewman's sense of humor. It is noteworthy that the Ram rocket set a speed record for production. From its conference room conception to its appearance in combat, it took only 24 days. Aerial missions of the Navy and Marines often include both strategic and tactical action in the same strike. In the relatively small area of Korea, targets of opportunity count heavily. Gun cameras record targets of the carrier planes. Kony, Japan. A B-26 raid is in preparation during the week of 6 September. The B-26 is armed with 16 50 caliber machine guns. These guns are electrically operated and a single gunner can bring many of them to bear on the same target at once. The B-26 can carry a 5,000 pound bomb load or five of these 1,000 pounders. With these bombs, plus napalm, plus the heavy firepower of the machine guns, a B-26 flight is a formidable attacking unit. These planes have seen constant use in the Korean War. Their targets ranging from strategic industrial areas in the north to tactical areas along the battle lines in the south. The B-26 is classified as a light bomber with a speed of more than 350 miles an hour. After their final briefing, crew members head for the field. This has become a familiar scene in United States air bases in Japan from which B-26 sorties are flown on an around-the-clock schedule. These B-26 Douglas Invaders were formerly called A-26 bombers. They differ from the B-26 Martin Marauders used in World War II. The present B-26 is a very adaptable plane which is often revamped for different purposes. Cannon may be substituted for the nose gun. The plane can be adapted to carry a variety of explosives, for the B-26 is designed primarily for low-level bombing. It is seldom used for the high-altitude work of the B-29. Targets are in the area of Seoul during the first week of September. The little flashes of light on the ground are tracers from the B-26 machine guns. Occasionally, enemy flak comes up at the plane. On 7 September, the U.S. Air Force flew 625 sorties in 24 hours. On 15 September, dawn breaks off the island of Walde. Ship 
troops of the UN fleet fire point blank at the island. Rockets join the softening up process. General MacArthur watches from the bridge of the flagship. This landing is a calculated risk. General MacArthur is using many of his reinforcements from the south. The first wave hits the beach. Because of the 30-foot tidefall, landing craft in the first waves must be run ashore in a period one hour before high tide and two hours after. The first troops landed here will have to stick it out alone until the next tide, 11 hours later. A bulldozer smothers a red dugout. A firefight begins. All the reds haven't been driven off by the bombardment. Captives are stripped to prevent concealment of weapons. Others are a little more formal. On 16 September, the 1st Marine Division moves through Inchon. This city is recaptured against relatively light resistance. Allied casualties are few. As these men move through Inchon, their objective is Seoul. There are two Allied moves on Seoul, one from the south and another sweeping around from the north across the Han River. The Han is crossed, a river village is taken, and the Marines move on toward Seoul. But there is bitter fighting ahead. Seoul is heavily defended. As these vehicles move on towards Seoul, the Marines have a message for the Reds. Enjoy yourself. It's later than you think. During the six weeks between 10 August and 20 September, the period covered by this combat bulletin, there were three main phases in the Korean fighting. On 10 August, reinforced United Nations forces were dug in to defend at all costs a beachhead perimeter bounded by the Naktong River. We could withdraw no farther, could no longer trade space for time if we were to hold our beachhead and the vital supply port of Pusan. Communist forces were threatening Pohang, Taigu, and Masan in their drive at Pusan. We had launched our first counterattack from Masan toward Chinju to stop the most dangerous communist drive. On 1 September, the Communists launched their biggest drive of the war all along our beachhead perimeter. It was an all-out effort to take Busan, eliminate our beachhead in Korea, and destroy United Nations forces. We were being pushed back again toward Masan, Taigu was in danger from the north and south, and Pohang was being taken and retaken. By 20 September, the tide of battle had changed completely. Five days previously, U.S. Marines had made an amphibious landing at Inchon, 150 miles behind the enemy lines. The enemy, still pressing his all-out drive for Pusan, was suddenly cut off from his supplies. On 20 September, U.S. Marines were entering the outskirts of Seoul as U.S. 7th Division infantrymen fanned southward to head off communists retreating from the southern front. On our southern beachhead, United Nations forces were crossing the Naktong River and moving ahead everywhere. They were advancing at Pohang, south of Wisong, north of Taigu and at Waiguan, west of Changyong and west of Masan.
We had held our beachhead. Now we were on the offensive, and it was the beginning of the end for the communist invasion of South Korea.